I'm Alwyn Cade and welcome to Alwyn Cade Living Soulfully and this is the 7th of the 4th 2020 I think the, time, the date is, is that right? I'm not sure what's happening but this is blinking at me for some reason. Um, yeah, hi, welcome. Uh, tonight's topic is past lives, present life. Now that's a huge subject and um, I thought that in order to introduce you to it, if you haven't already listened to my Soul's Journey Remember Who You Are podcast series, um, and if you have, this is this is me telling it to you kind of in person, uh, then I wanted to share some insights with you. Now, because it's such a vast subject, it has so many places that we could go. Um, I thought that we would do like the song from The Sound of Music and let's start at the very beginning. So we'll start at the beginning of our human journey and it's when we arrive here. Now, one of the things that's interesting about reincarnation and past lives is that we don't remember them and we don't remember that we have had them or that they ever existed or anything to do with reincarnation and why don't we remember well, basically, we don't remember because when we were children and we used to say things to our parents like, you know, oh, I can see a spirit or, um, you know, I, you have recollections of a past life memory and you're telling your parents something about that. They are thinking that you have an overactive imagination or you're making it up or you're playing, it's a game or whatever else it is, as opposed to you actually telling them something that's really significant and important. And of course, it's not really socially acceptable in our Western society that we actually have any kind of uh, past lives or belief in reincarnation. It's much more... Um, acceptable in Eastern philosophies, in some Eastern philosophies, that um, and, and in their beliefs, it's part of their life, it's part of what they've grown up with, that uh, a past life is, of course, um, a very significant thing to the family and to their way of being. Now, the Dalai Lama is a perfect example of that, and he is revered around the world by, by many people. And so, you know, he has a great belief in reincarnation, um, and I'm not, I'm not up on it, so I'm not going to go into it too much. I know what I know, but I don't want to go down that road. So let's just focus back on the past life, present life, and the children. Now, one of the really interesting um, works that I want to share with you tonight is the work of a man called Dr. Jim B. Tucker. And Dr. Tucker is, um, he is, now let me just refresh my memory so I make sure I've got everything absolutely correct here. Oh, goodness, it's going to play, and I don't want it to play. Hang on. No, I don't want it to play either. Stop. Um, the, he he works at the he is in the faculty at the University of Virginia Division of Perceptual Studies, and you'll see tonight when we post this that there are links on the side or as a link on the side of the broadcast, and it is to my website, and you can go there and you can have a look at um, those links and follow them through and to have a look at his work. It's a remarkable body of work. Uh, he came to it a second. It, it began through the work of Dr. Ian Stevenson. He was also from the uh, University of Virginia, from the same um, faculty. And so they did, they started the study of children who had past life memories. And they are academics. And they wanted to look into this further and, and Dr. Ian Stevenson led the way and, and Jim B. Tucker has taken over from him. Um, so where is this leading? Dr. Stevenson wanted to investigate these children to see if what was going on were actual real past lives. And, and what they did was that they would get um, people to families, mums and dads to to tell them if their children were having some kind of past life memory, what they thought was a past life memory. One of the things that, that they had to do was be very mindful that these children weren't influenced in any way or hadn't been influenced in any way by their family or hadn't been told stories or given this information. So they had to set up some, you know, some um, um, borders or boundaries to make sure that this didn't, didn't happen. Then they went off and started investigating and looking at these stories. And there's some incredible stories out there of these children and their memories. Now, the book that I came to a few years ago was 
Jim B. Tucker's Life Before Life, or Life After Life, sorry, I think it was, or Life Before Life, I'm just trying to remember what it is. Um, and he um, um, he talks and he has many stories about these children who have these past life memories. And they were able to, in many cases, to, to trace these lives of these children. Um, and and they were able to, to look into um, where these children had come from previously in their previous lives, which was just fascinating. And they were able to so often verify the information that these young children were, were giving them. Um, now, one of the other interesting, there's so many interesting things in this book by, by Dr. Tucker. Um, and he, he, one of them is, is about birthmarks. Now, if you have birthmarks anywhere on your body, or you know of anyone who's got a birthmark, then have a read of this book because it's just eye-opening. I just want to go into my own work. I, I, I won't call myself a skeptic, but I do require proof. I, I like to make sure that I research what I do really well and that I'm that I'm I've got a lot of information to come together synchronistic synchronistically and and um, academically and spiritually to be able to back up what I do. I, I'm not just randomly running off here at the mouth and thinking oh, I believe this so it must be true. I don't I don't feel like that. Um, I, I think that one of the things that's important is that uh, you, you know, don't just believe things blindly. Have a look for things. And and this book by Jim Tucker and many other books came to me, but this is the one that really jumps out at me the most. And I think one of the reasons it resonates is because it says so clearly that children have memories. They they see spirit. They remember where they've been before, and they express that in lots of different ways. What, I, what I'm asking of everybody is if you have young children, if you have, if you know of young children, you know, be more mindful of what they say to you and what they tell you. Listen to them a bit more instead of dismissing their little stories or, or their things they're saying to you as flights of fantasy or, as my mother used to say, an overactive imagination. Now, one of the things I want to do here is I just want to read you this. Um, I, I wrote this some time ago, and, and I want to just read this to you now because it, it, it's what sparked my wanting to talk to you. And this is a quote from the book Life Before Life by Jim B. Tucker. It, it's, it's what starts the book. He says, some children say that they have been here before. They give various details about previous lives, often describing the way in which they died. Of course, young children say a lot of things, and we may simply think that they are fantasizing as children often do. But what if, in a number of instances, people listened to the children and then tried to find out the events they described had actually happened? And what if, when those people went to the places the children had named, they found that what the children had said about the past events was indeed true? What then? And then that's a paragraph that's taken from Life Before Life. Okay, and then this is what I... Right. Each of us have been children. We would not be here if we had not been a baby or a child. As children, we are close to our spiritual self. Our memory, memory is still mostly intact. You may not remember now, but I venture to say that you told the adults around you at the time that you saw or felt spirit, or perhaps you had memories of your most recent life, which was discounted as a flight of fantasy or you making up stories. Some of you may have what are referred to as imaginary friends, which infers that they are made up and not real because only the child can see them. And not wishing to have disapproving parents, families, teachers or churches or communities, or to be punished for what you saw, you shut down your feelings, visions or memories and gave yourself over to the human way of life. You gave up any belief that you were spirit being human or that you had lived before and would live again. It's what we do to survive and it's what we have done throughout our many lifetimes to ensure our survival. Reincarnation is the most fundamental element of our lives. It's more important to us than our very breath here on earth. It answers all our questions about our place here now, life after death, life before life, and life between lives. The knowledge that we have lived before in many lives was a normal part of our belief system, and in some philosophies, Eastern philosophies, it still is. 
and the coming of Christianity, in particular the Council of Nicaea in 325 AD, heralded the beginning of our memory loss of who we are and how we came to be here. So why did we forget? Well, fear is the most powerful of all controlling tools. Our fear of reprisal, torture, grisly death brought about our amnesia. It's understandable that with the introduction of fear as the primary tool, we should soon forget that we were spirit being human with a direct path to God, as they call it, and that there was no hell, only heaven and spirit. Fear is still a huge amnesiac when it comes to repressing our feelings, memories and our ability to truly be ourselves. In the past 2020 years, there have been many dark times as we sought to find our way back to the light. And it began a few decades ago with the coming revolution in our thinking, which started, I believe, back in the 50s and 60s, 60s, sparked by events including the Vietnam War, contraception for women, the American Civil Rights Movement, and a turning from the churches to a personal relationship with our creators. Many were jailed, silenced, punished and killed in that time for their awareness. These events in our history were brought about by people of the time beginning to wake up en masse after a long sleep and remembering who they were. We could say that those before us in history have paved the way for us to be here now, living with the freedom that they struggled and fought for, and I totally agree. But further, I would say, we were our forefathers. We were those people. We were there in those times fighting for our freedom to remember who we are. We lived before and were the revolutionaries of the many ages who were perhaps burned at the stake or put to death in our beliefs. Beliefs. We were also those who suppressed others. We were the visionary men and women who stood up for what we remembered, that we are a spirit being human and that we are eternal and no one can take it from us. And then I finished with a, with a quote um, that came through some years ago um, from a channeling that I did. And um, it was in June 2008. Um, now, it was actually part of a reading for someone, but it's actually very poignant. And I think that it is, it is about the courage to stand up and be ourselves. And that this fear that I spoke of earlier in the piece um, that has stopped us from remembering and really being who we are is that we actually need to um, move away from that and, and truly stand in our power. And he said, courage is standing quietly in the stillness when all around you is falling apart. Bombs are falling, bullets are fry, flying, the air is filled with smoke and fear. Courage is about standing there and saying, what will come will come and I'm okay. And when you open your eyes, you will either be in spirit or you'll be standing on earth. Whichever way, you're all right. Whichever way, you are still okay. You are not gone. All is not lost. You just changed your mind, changed your form. So stand in the face of all of this with courage, quietness, dignity and grace and love and know that you will not fall. Now, I think that those are really important words for our, for our soul, for our minds and our souls to hear here on this earth plane, to know that it's actually okay for us to remember that nothing terrible is going to happen to us like it did before. One of the things that I, the links that I'm going to put on the homepage or have put on the homepage of my website is, um, is a, a really great um, um, interview with the, by John Cleese. He was the moderator of this uh, forum. And it's Is There Life After Death? And it's actually the Tom Tom Summit Festival, Summit and Festival um, in 2018. And, and there are the faculty of the University um, of Virginia's Division of Perceptual Studies. And Jim B. Tucker, of course, is one of them. Now, the really interesting thing about synchronicity is that as we've talked about before, is that you know we're we're often led, or we're most often led when we are willing to the right place at the right time, and that's a signpost for us. And one of the things that came out of that was I got led to go and be the wardrobe person for John Cleese, led Christchurch leg of his tour, some years ago in two thousand and five. And the interesting thing is that the, the show was about death and dying, um, and I was a funeral celebrant at the time. Um, and after it came about that he found out that that's what I did and was most interested, um, my friend told him that I'd had an out-of-body experience and he was like, oh, I really want to know more about that. We have to have coffee and talk. And of course, in his usual John Cleese fashion, he talked about um, how he, he wanted to have an OBE because it's probably the only one he's ever going to get. <laughs> I thought that was really funny. It, what, what, the, what came out of that conversation, I did have coffee with him, him and me, 
trust me, I'm as blown away. I really am. I treasure that. Um, was that he talked about, you know, these symposiums that he went to where he talked with these great minds and these and learned from them and sat with them and, and talked about life and death and life before life and, you know, and and in this case of course about past lives and and life after death so here are these great minds and and it's a great interview it's a great program so do listen to it the links on my home page um, and I think that that's, you know, that was a piece of synchronicity for me to to show me that I was on my right path doing what I was meant to be doing. Um, when I found that, that particular uh, YouTube video, I was just like, you know, wow, I'm, this is what he was telling me about. This is what he's doing, along with his other things that he's doing. Um, and um, to have that connection, to sit and watch it was just so reaffirming for me. Of, of the work that that I've been led to do and and then I just so love and enjoy sharing with other people um, I've just got a couple of notes here and I just want to refer to them if I can just because I don't want to miss anything out um, okay let's let's go back all right why don't we remember well we don't remember because we're not encouraged to remember and and our our, our religious Christianity doesn't encourage us to believe, it doesn't encourage us to remember, it hasn't over the eons, um, and also um, our Western philosophies don't encourage us to remember. That doesn't mean it's not true. It doesn't mean that it actually um, doesn't exist. And not and as we as we go through and we, we, we get a bit older like toddlers and then we go start going to school, of course you don't want to go to school and go, hey, I brought my imaginary friend to school. <laughs> that's not acceptable. Um, you don't want to go to school and talk about your past life memories because that's really not acceptable. You won't be you won't be treated well if you do stuff like that. But we can, as I said, encourage our children within our own homes and our four walls and in our, in our smaller sort of circles of people who do believe. And then we can begin the process of spreading that wider and wider. Why should we do that? For every statement, I think there is always, there is always a question that should go with that. Why should we do that? Because the whole the thing about reincarnation is it's a huge gift to us. If you Have you ever said that, you know, God, I wish I'd had the opportunity to do that over again. If I had the opportunity over again, I would do that and I would do that differently. And, and that's what it's about. It's like, well, you, in that lifetime, you, you did this and this and this. And, and now you, you choose to come back in to reincarnate with a specific group of people who then you can then um, work through those things and hopefully remember to make better choices. So how can you remember to make better choices? Well, by becoming more awake and more aware. John and I have just been reading a series of really interesting books, and I think I touched on this last time. Um, it's a, a lady called Jackie French, and I called her Frances last time, but it's actually Jackie French. And she's written these books called Miss Lily's Lovely Ladies, Miss Lily, The Lily and the Rose, and The Lily in the Snow. And they are set back in World War One, pre World War One, and just after World War One, and the time of the Great Depression. And I think what was really interesting about those books, they're, they're, they're fictional books, but she's done so much research into the history of the time, is that World War I and World War II, what that did for us as women was that it actually changed our consciousness. Because women had to step up and, and do men's jobs, it, it, it meant that we elevated ourselves out of this place that women had no place being where they were. They couldn't do what men did. And we're like, yes, we can. And then, of course, when the men came home, we got kind of stuffed back down again. Okay. And then that changed our consciousness. It kind of woke us up to go, oh, remember? Remember that? Remember the feminine? Okay. And and I'm going to do um, a, a, a next week's topic is going to be feminine consciousness because this has really kind of sparked this for me to, to look into this more. And I want to share that with you. And so, you know, it, I look back in the 70s when I was a teenager, 60s and 70s, and we were still archaic, even though we were supposedly really modern, we were still really archaic when it came to women. We were still back in the dark ages and the Victorian thinking and, you know, pre-Victorian, I go back to Victorian because it's kind of my most recent 
um, reference point um, for, for women not having a say. But then looking at that time and coming up through that time, women started to get the vote back there too. So something happened in there. Something changed that. What changed that? What changes things is that more people start to remember who they are on a more conscious level. More people start to ask questions. More people start to wake up. And the more that wake up and the more that remember that they're part of something much greater than themselves and much greater than what is going on, become more observant and less kind of in the drama. If we can step out of the drama and we start to look at things through different eyes, we'll begin to see that there are some really interesting patterns going on. And then if we start looking at our own individual journeys, we will also see that there is something really important and quite divine playing out here. That when we came into our families, it wasn't by accident that we chose to come in there. And we chose to play out the roles that we have played daughter, wife, mother, son, husband, friend, lover, enemy, whatever it is, we've come into those roles. Now, I've talked about this before, that one of the things I do is a, called a soul group mapping. And it, it looks like a family tree, and it is, in all intents and purposes, a family tree. But it also really shows glaringly the consciousness of the soul group. Because if you look at your family tree, these people are the fundamental players in your soul group. They influence you more than anyone else. Because when we come in, we are helpless. We have to rely on them. They may not be our birth family. They may be an adopted family. They may be a foster family. But nevertheless, they are still part of that very close, intense soul group that we're going to learn an awful lot from in that short space of time. And People talk about karma, and one of the other things that I have on my soul's journey is, is soul contracts and karma. Is that a lot of a karma debt, and please don't think that karma is a punishment because it's actually not. It's a beautiful thing. It is something we choose to do. We choose to come in and choose scenarios and circumstances that we can see from the other side. For me, and what I've learned and what I've studied is that karma is about seeing from the other side. It is from the others, from a, from the other point of view. Okay, so let's say that in in a previous lifetime you have been the abuser. Okay, then then from a soul's perspective, which has no judgment, you will want to come in and you will want to experience that from the other side you want to know what that feels like from the other side so that you can have a whole experience that sounds just so foreign doesn't it to our human mind our human mind goes no why would i ever have chosen that why would i choose to do that and i've had people rail at me and go how dare you say that and i just go look you know i've seen this i've had people come to me for life path journeys who have had terrible lives only to find when they go in there that they have actually done something back then that they have just they've, and they've taken it with them when they when they left the earth and they have wanted to not put it to rights from the point of view of the other souls because there was no judgment in, in spirit but they've wanted to to put it to rights with themselves so that they can experience that from the other side they want to know what that feels like they want, to, they, want to, they want to make themselves feel a more whole soul, more well-rounded. Now, we do that here too. We do exactly the same thing. We, we, we do one thing and we want to go, I want to know what that feels like from over there. So I, I want to go experience that. Oh, yeah, that's what it feels like. Oh, okay. I think a really classic example of that is, is as a parent, you know, when you're a kid, you know, you think, oh, your parents, you know, they do this and they do that. Mm -hmm. Can't understand why they did this. And then you become a parent, you go, oh, gosh, okay, whoops. I can kind of see that now. You know, my mum used to say this and that to me. My dad used to say this and that. And now it's like, oh, I hear myself saying that to my children. Or, yeah, gosh, I'm, I can see why they did that or didn't do that. 
when we become an adult, we can reflect upon the child. And when we have children, we can reflect and look upon our parents and see it from the other perspective, which is which is really important. Now, that's just an example of, of something that I have learned myself, you know, um, from my own mum, uh, my experiences with her. So that's what that's what this reincarnation thing is all about. What what is it for? It's for us to come in and fulfil that prophecy, that statement to ourselves that if we could do things differently, if we had another opportunity to do it, we would do things differently. And sometimes we repeat them over and over and over again, lifetime after lifetime after lifetime. And it's like, why don't we get them? Why doesn't that wake us up? Why do we have to do that? And and that's because just like here, you know, we can we can do the same things over and over and over until something goes, you need to stop that. It has to get so bad or you need to stop that. That doesn't serve you anymore. And then we'll go, now I'm ready to see that differently. But the beautiful thing is that we don't have to do it all now. We don't have to fulfill everything in this lifetime. So we can all kind of calm down and, and slow down and just, allow things to play out as they need to and I need to hear this as much as anyone does I need to listen to myself say that because you know this this kind of panic that oh I'm 61 and my life's just about over and I haven't done half the things I wanted to do and then I have to sort of go whoa hang on stop you know this is just one of gazillions of incarnations I will have in many different dimensions and places and I hear myself saying that and going, wow, you know, that's that's really out there, isn't it? But I know it's true from my work and from what I've seen and from my research and from my work with spirit. I know that's true. So if you're in there kind of going, I'm running out of time, I've got all these things I need to do, or if you've got something going on that keeps playing over and over and over for you, you know something you keep repeating or, or you or you can't understand why you keep doing that it's because you brought it in with you and it's from a past life and you need to look at it you need to examine it you need to understand what it's about and one of the ways that I've done that for people is to take them on light path journeys now I do like past journeys in person but I have actually also done them over the internet which is a really interesting process too and there are some criteria for that if you ever wanted to give it a go. Um, and uh, it's been very successful when I've done it over the internet. Um, people have had some really good results with it. So um, you might want to give it a go at some stage. So um, go and have a look at that work from Jim Tucker. And I've also put an Amazon link up there on my on the front page of my web page. Um, website so that you can um, go to Amazon if you want to or you might have your own online bookstore you go to but it is a wonderful read it's full of these amazing stories of these children now there's one here that I want to read to you um, it's my probably one of my favorite stories there are so many in there um, I want to read this to you I hope I'm not breaching copyright by doing this but I just want you to sit and have a listen to the story so just do okay <laughs> John McConnell, a retired New York City policeman working as a security guard, stopped at an electronics store after work one night in 1992. He saw two men robbing the store and pulled out his pistol. Another thief behind a counter began shooting at him. John tried to shoot back, and even after he fell, he got up and shot again. He was hit six times. One of the bullets entered his back and sliced through his left lung, his heart, and the main pulmonary artery, the blood vessel that takes blood from the right side of the heart to the lungs to receive oxygen. He was rushed to hospital but did not survive. John had been close to his family and had frequently told one of his daughters, Doreen, no matter what, I'm always going to take care of you. Five years after John died, Doreen gave birth to a son named William. William began passing out soon after he was born. Doctors diagnosed him with a condition called, condition called pulmonary valve atresia, in which the valve of the pulmonary artery had not adequately formed, so blood cannot travel through to the lungs. In addition, one of the chambers of his heart, the right ventricle, had not formed properly as a result of the problem with the valve. He underwent several surgeries, although he will, he will need to take medication indefinitely, indefinitely, he's done quite well. William had birth defects that were similar to the fatal wounds suffered by his grandfather. In addition, when he became old enough to talk, 
he began talking about his grandfather's life. One day when he was three years old, his mother was at home trying to work in her study when William kept acting up. Finally, she told him, sit down or I'm going to spank you. William replied, Mum, when you were a little girl and I was your daddy, you were bad a lot of times and I never hit you. His mother was initially taken back by this. As William talked more about the life of his grandfather, she began to feel comforted by the idea that her father had returned. William talked about being his grandfather a number of times and discussed his death. He told his mother that several people were shooting during the incident when he was killed, and he asked a lot of questions about it. One time he said to his mother, when you were a little girl and I was your daddy, what was my cat's name? She responded, do you mean maniac? No, no, not that one. The white one, Boster, his mum asked. Yeah, William responded. I used to call him Boss, right? Well, that was correct. The family had two cats named Maniac and Boston, and only John referred to the white one as Boss. One day, Doreen asked William if he remembered anything about the time before he was born. He said that he died on Thursday and went to heaven. He said that he saw animals there and also talked to God. He said, I told God I was ready to come back and I got born on Tuesday. Well, Doreen was amazed that William mentioned days since he did not even know his days of the week without prompting. She tested him by saying, so you were born on Thursday and died on Tuesday? He quickly responded, no, I died Thursday at night, was born Tuesday in the morning. Well, he was correct on both counts. John died on a Thursday and William was born on a Tuesday five years later. He talked about the period between lives at other times. He told his mother, when you die, you don't go right to heaven. You go to different levels, here and then here and then here, as he moved his hands up each time. He said that animals are reborn as well as humans and that the animals he saw in heaven didn't bite or scratch. John had been a practicing Roman Catholic, but he believed in reincarnation and said that he would take care of animals in his next life. His grandson William says that he will be an animal doctor and will take care of large animals at a zoo. William reminds Doreen of her father in several ways. He loves books, as his grandfather did. When they visit William's grandmother, he can spend hours looking at books in John's study, duplicating his grandfather's behaviour from years before. And William, like his grandfather, is good at putting things together and can be a non-stop talker. William especially reminds Doreen of her father when he tells her, don't worry, Mum, I'll take care of you. And that, I think, is is just such a profound story. And, and it's true. That's that's what Jim Tucker and Ian Stevenson discovered when they went and investigated the story um, of this little boy who remembered being his grandfather. And so, and you were like that too, and so was I. We were always like that. We were all like that. We just don't remember. We weren't encouraged to remember. So I guess I would just say to you one thing. If you're thinking about looking at reincarnation, then go with an open mind and see where it leads you. Um, it certainly led me down some pretty amazing roads and still does and is still the main source of my work. As I've said before, it was the main thing that came to me and I was led to do when, after I had my out-of-body experience in 1988 and it still does. So go to the website, have a look at those links, um, track them down, watch the the john cleese um and the symposium it was it's absolutely amazing these people are just astounding as to what they're investigating and i think the thing that's really really good about it is that it's not that we can't be believed because we don't have phds or that you know we don't have anything um the credentials to our name as such it's not about that it's just that from an academic point of view it is important that it is it is uh, researched and looked into on all sides, and that gives more validity to what we're doing. Um, and so, um, and then John's just written down here and told me to tell you to tune in next week, as I said before, and we're going to talk about the feminine consciousness um, prompted by these amazing books that we've been reading. So I'll just tell you what they are. They're, they're Jackie French, and they start with um, Miss Lily's Lovely Ladies, and they're just amazingly written if you want a good fictional read. And it's really interesting about how it is set pre World War One um, and leading into the 1920s, which is where we are now. So I'm going to leave you with that. Good night to everybody. Go well. Um, I hope you're not all going stir crazy out there in the world, and you can find things to do to keep yourselves occupied over these next few weeks for however long. So go well 
and bless you all. Bye for now.